Great, thank you so much, Seth. Um, and thanks so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm really excited. As Seth said, we've got two fantastic speakers lined up. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker. I've had the pleasure of working alongside him. He's a great guy um, and very passionate. Um, so Mr. Mohammed Raz undertook his medical studies at Tanta University in Egypt. Um, he then spent time within residency training at Tanta and within Cairo, achieving postgraduate medical degrees uh, in neurosurgery and neurointervention. He spent time as an assistant lecturer of neurosurgery and interventional neuroradiology at Tanta University. He then came to the UK, where he spent one year at the University of Oxford and graduated with a master's in endovascular neurosurgery. Um, he then spent two years within London as a specialist registrar, firstly within the UCL and then the St. George's Hospitals Trusts. And then he came here to Glasgow in 2019 um, where he served as a senior clinical fellow in neurosurgery um, at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. He's very passionate about endovascular neurosurgery, as you can tell um, from his CV, but also healthcare entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and I'm very excited to pass on to Mr. Draz now for a talk on ETV. Thanks so much for the introduction. I'm um, uh, very happy and excited to um, um, be with you guys today. Uh, thanks, Seth. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks, everyone who arranged that um, um, workshop uh, today. So um, today I'll be talking about ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Um, there will be um, a couple of uh, slides where we have um, Kind of a questions or um, a mentee um, uh, question. So if you can have your phones just ready with the code that you can use to uh, answer the questions, just to make it a little bit interactive. Um, so I'll just share my screen and audience wait to this one. Share. You see that? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So um, I work as a senior clinical fellow in neurosurgery in Glasgow at the moment. Um, you can see me on LinkedIn a lot. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me about anything, I'll be uh, delighted. And um, also have uh, my YouTube channel with my colleague, Adi, which we started recently. So if, if you're interested in um, uh, watching a bit of <laughs> neurosurgery kind of uh, um, educational videos, that, that might be uh, interesting. So um, to start with is um, the learning points from today is basically what's ETV. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the basic uh, uh, anatomy and also touch base about the radiological anatomy and, and what we're looking in, in the scans basically. And then uh, why we use ETV and when, when can we use it? And uh, also I will talk about the procedure itself, how we do it in real life. A couple of videos that I will share and show um, how we do it exactly and then the success and complications that can happen with this procedure. And if you just get your uh, phones and if you go into Minty, and I will share that in a second. So trying to get out of this one, stop share, and then I'll share again. Okay, just give it a second, a few seconds until people join. So basically the question is what percentage of those three animals that you can see, you think that they have the, the highest percentage of successful kills. This has nothing to do with neurosurgery, has nothing to do with ATV actually. But <laughs> um, Okay, 
UK. I'll just make that to start. So if you guys answer that. Good. So it sounds like seven of you uh, chosen the uh, right answer, which is African wild dogs. But um, most of you chose domestic cats and lions were not successful in that competition. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that later. But anyway. OK, so um, we'll just get back to the um, to the ATV. So ATV is basically uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and um, the the main the, the ATV is mainly used to treat hydrocephalus, and um, hydrocephalus is one of the most complex problems in neurosurgery, um, and dealing with the CSF hydrodynamics is quite com complex. To be honest, uh, it's it might be simple procedures, but changing the dynamics of the CSF in the brain uh, can lead to a lot of changes that we, I think we, we don't understand that uh, quite yet. And the usual treatment for a hydrocephalus was basically to insert a shunt. I will show later on um, how we put the shunt shunt and there is more than one, but also it's, it carries a lot of complications, especially infection and also uh, patient requiring a lot of surgeries for, for revision of those uh, shunts, uh, either being broken or disconnected and so on. So because of all of these problems that comes with the shunts, that was there was a need to come with another innovation or another treatment for hydrocephalus, and here came the ATV. So the neurosurgeons, whenever you ask anyone, they love ATV uh, because it's basically a substitute to another complex uh, um, um, uh, procedure which is insertion for shunt uh, not complex in terms of difficulty putting it but difficulty managing the patient and the complications that comes out of it and also it's a lovely procedure because you see the, uh, the anatomy of the ventricles which I would show in, in, in a minute so the, we'll just uh, go through the ventricular anatomy might be um, a refreshment for for your um, knowledge from the medical school um, so uh, here um, these pictures are from the neurosurgical atlas which is a, a wonderful website if you want to have any um, um, information or knowledge about uh, neurosurgery it's, it's a wonderful website it has a lot of illustrations and a lot of uh, um, uh, very good videos so here you can see that this is with in blue is the um, uh, the lateral ventricle and that connects the, through the foramen of Monroe towards the, um, the third ventricle and then back through the aqueduct to the fourth ventricle. And that we can show, we can see here from that sagittal picture or that sagittal view, uh, you can see the, the whole structure of the, uh, or most of the structure of the natural ventricle. There's another view, we're kind of looking from above and basically you can see the, the, the complete structure of the two lateral ventricles with the uh, but, uh, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, then the body, and then more posterior is the occipital horn of the of the lateral ventricle, and then the temporal horn, which extends all the way to um, to the temporal temporal lobe, and it looks like a C-shaped uh, structure in the brain. This is a kind of dissected three D image of the of the ventricular system, um, and again, uh, you can see the third ventricle. I'm uh, sorry, the lateral ventricle I've, I've just explained, and then there's a little corner. I'm not sure if you can see my my um, the pointer. Is that, is that yeah, seen yeah. or not? Yes. Okay. I'll just come back. So you can see here the the, um, the foramen of Monroe connecting to the third ventricle, and then from the third ventricle, you can see the cerebral aqueduct, and that connects to the fourth ventricle down there. That's again the cerebral aqueduct, and that's the fourth ventricle, and then the fourth ventricle. Um, connects to the rest of the subarachnoid space through the foramen of Magindi and Lushka. So the CSF is basically produced from the croid plexus, which is here in, in you can see in, in that uh, red color in the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle produces the CSF, go through the lateral ventricle, third ventricle, all the way down through the aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, 
and then goes outside the fourth ventricle through the foramen of Magendi and Lushka, and then goes to the subarachnoid spaces either around the, around the brain or around the spine. And also the CSF that goes through the central canal within the spinal cord as well. And then that all, you know, kind of runs all over the subarachnoid space and goes through the arachnoid granulation, which is kind of a small pouches that goes into the superior sagittal sinus where it drains the, um, the CSF into the venous circulation, basically. Um, so it's quite a complex system in terms of the um, um, CSF circulation and production. And you can imagine that at any point of that uh, circulatory system that uh, can lead to any obstruction of the flow um, or um, can lead to uh, hydrocephalus basically at the end. Again, that's a nice illustration. Again, just 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 to keep that that image in your mind about the lateral ventricle and uh, and the whole ventricular system. Um, uh, it takes a, a little while to kind of uh, um, get that three D anatomy in your mind um, um, of the ventricular system. That's a very nice picture from a neurosurgical kind of dissection from Rotun, uh, just one of the wonderful. Um, 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 anatomical box for uh, uh, books for neurosurgery, um, which again, uh, you can see here the corpus callosum, and you can see the lateral ventricle, and then um, that's the area on the third ventricle. And then again, that's the cerebral aqueduct. Here is the brain stem, midbrain, with the um, uh, tectum here, and that's the area in between is, is the cerebral aqueduct, and that goes all the way to the fourth ventricle again. Um, and all of the uh, vascular anatomy and um, uh, either arterial supply or venous anatomy around, around this area. So just to touch again on, on, the, on the radiological anatomy. So um, as you all know, the MRI scan, we get three, three planes or the CT, we get three planes of imaging, which is the sagittal plane, coronal plane and, and transverse plane or the axial plane, uh, as we call it. So uh, here is a normal MRI scan, and that's that's an axial axial view. Here at the higher levels, slightly higher levels, where we can see the the body of the lateral ventricle on each side. If we go a little bit down, we can see the um, the uh, anterior horn of the of the lateral ventricle, and uh, posteriorly the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. If we go uh, lower, um, we can see the third ventricle, which is always looks like a slit shaped on, on in the midline, and uh, that's this part is again is kind of the rest of the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle, and much lower, uh, just posterior to the brain stem, you can find here the the fourth ventricle. That's a sagittal view. Again, it's the same picture as we saw earlier with the, with the, with the dissection anatomy, uh, um, where you can see the corpus callosum. You can see here the, the, the hypo-intense area or this black area, which contains the CSF. That's the lateral, that's the lateral ventricle. The third ventricle should be around here. And that's, there's a, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't be able to appreciate that much, but there's a, a, a kind of small line here, which is the cerebral aqueduct, and that goes into the fourth ventricle and again through all the subarachnoid spaces. Um, that's a coronal view. Uh, it's a T2 weighted image. So you can see the difference between the first one, which is a T1 weighted image, and this one is a T2 weighted image where the CSF looks bright. Um, so um, again, that's the ventricles, the lateral ventricle, and that's connecting to the foramen of Monroe through to the lateral to the lat to the third ventricle. Okay, so what about hydrocephalus? So hydrocephalus or enlarged ventricles can be either communicating or non-communicating, and. The difference is basically either the, 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 four, the four ventricles are connected together or not. Um, um, and the communicating hydrocephalus is there's no obstruction to the absorption of the CSF. These are kind of specific types of hydrocephalus. We're not talking about this. Absorption of the CSF is obstructed. So that's a communicating hydrocephalus, which means that the, 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 the hydrocephalus is happening because of the 
absorption through the arachnoid granulation into the uh, superior sagittal sinus is not working fine. And that's most commonly in, in meningitis patients because the arachnoid layers are kind of um, uh, went through an infectious stage and then it be becomes fibrosed and the, the, the absorption of the CSF is not uh, as, as, as it should be. And then non-communicating where basically there is obstruction to the normal absorption of the CSF is that thus always present and this obstructive hydrocephalus where there is a tumor or um, um, a congenital abnormality which is causing obstruction of the normal flow between the, the three, between the lateral to the third or to the fourth ventricle. I've put here just two pictures of sagittal views and it's just between, on the right side you can see a normal anatomy and on the left side you can see a patient with hydrocephalus and that's just to appreciate the difference when the patient gets hydrocephalus, what happens? So you can see the lateral ventricle is very small, but here it's quite large and the corpus callosum is pushed up and thinned. The third ventricle, again, is quite big. You can see the cerebral aqueduct that we've barely seen here on the, on the, on the sagittal view. It's wide open here in this area. And again, the, the, the fourth ventricle is wide open and the CSF space here as well is, is wide open. So. Uh, that's that's basically hydrocephalus for whatever reason, but uh, it's just to give give you an idea about the size of the. Uh, you have to keep an, in your mind what's the size of the normal ventricle. So you when you see a scan with an abnormal sized ventricle, you can say okay, you can spot it and say okay, that's that there's a abnormality within the ventricles here. Again, that's the same picture that I showed earlier with, with on the right side with the normal anatomy, but here on the left side you can see the enlargement of the ventricles. The lateral ventricle is quite large. And then again, the picture at the level of the third ventricle, which you can see that is a slit like small um, um, ventricle, but here it's quite large. It is ballooned third ventricle, what we call it. So that's, that's just about the radiological anatomy in terms of the ventricles and how it looks like in normal patient or a normal person and um, how it looks like in a patient with hydrocephalus. That's the patient going for an ETV. Patient is usually in supine position, um, usually in a neutral head position. It's not tilted to any side. Uh, on the left here, they have the neuronavigation. Uh, I think Ali will be talking about neuronavigation later on, so we'll probably give more details about that. Um, you can see here that uh, on the left side, that this kind of a reference mark for the neuronavigation, and here kind of registering the patient with uh, on the neuronavigation. That's the incision, which, which is usually aiming for Cocker's point or uh, kind of on, on around the, 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 the coronal suture or slightly anterior to the coronal suture. And we go off the midline about three, three centimeter off the midline. So you can hear little dots here, which is kind of representing the midline. You can't go near that because if you go there, you'll be in the superior sagittal sinus and a lot of bleeding. And um, that's, that's not um, something that you want to see. <laughs> and then, um, here you can see the line of incision. It's not a big incision um, because you just need a, a bare hole where basically you get give access to the to the endoscope. On the left side, you can see that uh, on the top of the image is uh, on the left side is the reference um, of the um, of the kind of the stellate for the neuronavigation navigation that we use. Um, down there is the endoscope. Hope catheter. I will show this in a video just in a, in a moment, and how, how we use that. You can see here on the uh, right side of the image is the peel away catheter with the um, with the neuro navigation. Still, it will be go th going through this um, um, peel away catheter to guide us towards the ventricle. Um, neuro navigation is basically an, an, an adjunct tool that you can use if the ventricles are large. You can just go um, with with uh, relying on on anatomical landmarks as we usually do. In, in a lot of cases, you don't need a neuro navigation, but um, um, it's always good to have you know uh, more confirmation with neuro navigation. So this is how it looks like with a peel away catheter after the bare hole was done. Peel away catheter is going in and the uh, with the, with the stellate inside. That's a picture with the endoscope going into the bell hole and into the brain. 
once we inside the brain, that's the anatomy as we see inside. So this here we are on the uh, on the in the lateral ventricle, and you can see here this uh, structure is the choroid plexus, and all of the venous venous anatomy around it. And this is the foramen of Monroe. So the aim is to go through the lateral ventricle through the foramen of Monroe towards the um, um, the, the floor of the third ventricle. And the main aim is to create an opening in through the floor of the third ventricle. And that basically creates an alternative pathway rather than going through the lateral ventricle to the third to the fourth. Rather than that, it will go through the lateral ventricle to the third and then through the floor of the third ventricle to the um, uh, prepontine uh, area towards the subarachnoid space, basically. So basically, we are creating an alternative uh, pathway, but it's an anatomical pathway rather than using a shunt. Coming to point about the shunt, I just wanted to show you how it looks like and why people don't like shunts. So here you can see the shunt is basically um, 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 a system which drains the CSF from the brain all the way to the abdomen, to the peritoneal space. You can put it in, in other places rather than the peritoneum. You can put it in the plural space or other places. But the, the standard kind of first um, thing to do is to go through the uh, to the peritoneum. And so it has a proximal catheter which goes into the uh, lateral ventricle and then a distal catheter which extends from the head. And it needs to be tunneled all the way below, below the skin, just below the skin all the way into the abdomen and through another incision, we put it through the, this incision into the peritoneal space. As you can see here on this, um, uh, on the picture on, on the, on the right-hand side. And I just put on the left-hand side is the tunneler. I just wanted to show you that because I think that's one, one of the most brutal parts of the procedure for, for neurosurgery, to be honest, uh, because you need to tunnel that from the head all the way push that metal thing all the way under the skin uh, towards the abdomen. Uh, it's, it's quite tricky to do intraoperatively. Sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, it's much easier in the pediatric um, uh, population, but again, it's, it's, it's brutal to be honest, I don't like it. You can see here a, 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 a little kid who's kind of prepared for the shunt. And I just wanted to show that picture because here you can see that tunnel that is extending from the head and it cuts coming out from the abdomen and basically we uh, use that as, as, as a space to the push the catheter through it so that we can feed it under the skin and connect the whole system together. Just That's just a picture from one of the um, uh, uh, shunts in the market. I mean, there are a lot of uh, manufacturers for the VP shunts, but um, um, this is one of them. It's just basically having a proximal catheter and having a distal catheter, which, which extends. And these are kind of reservoirs for CSF. And it's, it has also a valve, which uh, regulates the amount and the pressure of the flow of the CSF. And um, because of that, you have a device in place, which has a risk of infection. It has a risk of obstruction. It has a risk of disconnection. It has a risk of uh, over drainage or less drainage. So um, it needs a lot of, of, of um, uh, changes. and. Um, each kid would, would probably go through multiple operations for shunt revision at, at some point in their life. So that's a case that we have done uh, recently. And <clears throat> as you can see, I've, as, as I just showed the, the, the last images um, here, that you can see the enlargement of the whole ventricular system. And here at, at the outlet of the fourth ventricle, you can see that there's a little kind of uh, wet or, or obstruction. So there's an obstruction on the flow out from the, the fourth ventricle. Um, and the change of the CSF hydrodynamics it doesn't just affect the brain, but it also affects the spine. And because of that building pressure in the brain, you can see here also that it's causing a problem within the spinal cord itself, where it's creating uh, CSF spaces within inside, with, inside the spinal cord, which we call it syringomyelia. So that's not just confined to the brain. So it's all connected together. Okay, so I hope that you kind of, you know, uh, now understand a little bit of the anatomy and you can tell if we are going through the ventricle, which one uh, of these points we should use uh, to, um, 
to do the ventriculostomy. Um, let me just... I'll just share that in a second, just a second. So I think we have done it before, so I'm not sure if, how, how to do that again. Um, okay, so I'll just share that. Okay, so if you can choose between one or two or three, where, where exactly we should do the ventriculostomy. That's a good sign. <laughs> Good, so, I mean, almost all of you got, got the right answer, which is three. Um, I'll just share that screen again. Audience view, share. Okay, so yeah, so as, as most of you chose the right answer is basically three. Three is the floor of the third ventricle where, where we do the ventriculostomy. Um, two is just the outlet of the fourth ventricle and one is just the, um, um, the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, which is connecting between the third and fourth. Um, so we don't need to do anything about that. Okay, so that's just a little video from the Neurosurgical Atlas. So um, you can see that working, isn't it? Okay, so as you can see here, the bear hole is being done. Once the bear hole is done, we just feed the peel away catheter and that's guided by the neuronavigation to go into the brain, aiming for the lateral ventricle. Um, and the peel away catheter is basically just a, a catheter that helps us to go through the brain, softly through the brain, and then you can put the endoscope through it. Um, that's a little burr hole, it's not um, just a standard burr hole. You push, we push the uh, peel away catheter. Literally and that's going in once that's we know that this is in place you can see a gush of csf coming out then we peel away the catheter and we put the endoscope in as 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 we go going in we'll see the normal the normal anatomy uh, inside so we're going through the lateral ventricle first i'm sorry just a second uh, Can't see a scroll through this, I'm sorry. So I'll just repeat that quickly because I can't see the, <laughs> the scroll bar for to, to go through it. <laughs> so again, the neuro navigation, um, peel away catheter. <laughs> going through the brain brain tissue and um, once that's in you see the CSF coming out endoscope going in and once we see here that will be the the lateral ventricle where we see the cryo plexus as we go in I'll just start coming a second so that's the, the cryo plexus that's the foramen of Monroe once we advance the endoscope into the frame of Monroe, we can see the, the floor of the third ventricle. 
and that's there's a kind of transparent membrane in the floral third ventricle where we will just puncture that and that creates another pathway as we do as as we as, as i just explained uh we just widen that that um, um ventriculostomy make sure that the ccf is going through and once we go through here we can see the blood vessel which is that that, that would be the basilar artery um on that on that side that's a video from my colleague Adi that was um, just explaining about the anatomy. So this, that's that we're here through the, the third ventricle. These are the mammillary bodies. The thin area here is the floor of the third ventricle. And you can see here there's a kind of uh, um, um, red area around here, which is the basilar artery. That's the infundibular recess. And we push the Fogarty catheter. I'm not sure why that stopped. Sorry, guys, a problem with the. Just give me a second. You can see that, yeah. Yep. Okay, so again, we we put the the Fogarty catheter, which is a balloon catheter, through push it in to create the the ventriculostomy, and once that's in, we open it, we we inflate the balloon to to make the opening wider, which will happen now in just in a second. So we inflate that. Be careful here, you know, because puncture. If you're going through here, you're going very close to the brainstem, very close to the basilar artery. So that can be dangerous. I mean, that can cause catastrophic bleeding if it goes through the basilar artery. So you have to, you know, go through the right spot on the floor of the third ventricle. If the anatomy is disturbed, it might be very difficult to do so. Um, once that's open, as you can see. Um, you can see the basilar artery here, and that's that's through the prepontine space, basically. So it's just in front of the pons. Hey, Mr. Gerard, could you could we just wrap up in the next couple of minutes, just because um, yeah. Mr. Haddad has to go at quarter to nine? Sorry. No worries. No worries. I nearly done. Good, so that's just a quick picture of a CSF flow study that we do post-operative and you can see um, the uh, flow of the of the fluid through the through the floor of the third ventricle. Again, that's a similar picture where, where you can see the turbulence of the flow through the floor of the third ventricle. So that that post-operatively shows us that you know we have enough enough flow um, um, through the floor. That's a pre and post picture. So on the left, you have the pre-operative picture where the floor here, you can see that's intact. Well, on post-operative picture, you can see the ventriculostomy has been open and that's connecting uh, all the way through the third ventricle to the pre space. That's just a um, um, kind of a zoomed image just to show you the ventriculostomy area. So uh, generally speaking, the advantages of ETV includes, you know, um, um, it, it doesn't have higher infection risk compared to the shunt. The duration of effect is much higher. So for a shunt, basically the patient would have um, um, in, the, in the first, um, the risk of shunt malfunction in the first two years is very high and that continues over with time. However, in contrast to ETV, the risks is, is high in the, in the first six months or one year, but then it flattens, the curve flattens. So that means if the patient had successful ETV or outcome from ETV in the first um, 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 uh, six months to one year, then it probably will be successful. Um, and then the complications with, with ETV is quite low. Uh, I would say 8% is quite high, but, but um, 
it probably will be quoted less than that, but mainly morbidity from the operation or vascular injury if it happens to um, important things like the basilar artery. We use that score, which is called ATV success score, which is mainly to quantify the, the, the likelihood of success of the ATV um, and um, depends on three main things, which is the age and the etiology of the, of the, if the patient had a previous shunt or not. The, uh, the, the, the higher the score, that means the higher uh, probability of the ATV being uh, working. So let's say a kid less than one month with a previous infection and had a, a previous shunt that unlikely that would work. So just just that that was a point to say that you know even we think that lions are the kings and <laughs> um, um, but uh, African wild dogs had uh, has the highest highest percentage of successful kills um, and the point is that you, you, you in life that we, you have to keep trying and trying and trying and you know that the king of of um, uh, which is the lion is basically has twenty five percent chance of succeeding so we probably wouldn't have uh, higher than the lines anyway. <laughs> I would stop here. I had a couple of slides as, as nothing neurosurgery related, but I'll stop here just to get to Ali's um, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Raz. <clears throat> that was a really wonderful talk. Um, very visual as well. Um, I've just noticed a question in the chat from Mohammed. Um, we'll probably just in the, for the sake of time and um, keep the questions to the end. Um, if you have any urgent questions, just pop them in the chat and we can pass them on to either Mr. Draz or Ali at the end. But yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Draz. Uh, that was fantastic. I'll hand over to Isabel now thank for the second.